Colonel Stan Perigin with the 932nd Airlift Wing Public Affairs. Today, our special guest is Captain Jessica Emery with the Air Medical Evacuation Squadron. Jessica, great to have you here. You, thank you. I understand that your medical experience or interest started way back in elementary school with some kind of stuffed animal. Yes. So when I was a kid, I had a little stuffed raccoon. It was a McDonald's toy from when Pocahontas came out. And my brother ripped it. So I was devastated. I was probably six years old at the time. So my dad, who was a nurse, brought home a suture kit and it was able to suture the back of it. And then he gave it back to me. So he had fixed my little raccoon that meant the world to me at the time. So that's kind of when the whole medical interest started. So you worked in a hospital intensive care unit. What led you to join the Air Medical Evacuation Squadron? So I had always wanted to join the military. Um, I just never really pulled the trigger until I went to a dear friend of mine's retirement ceremony. Um, she was in the Navy and I just, I saw the camaraderie they had um, even after 20 plus years of service. And so I started looking at medical squadrons and even from the point that I had first started nursing, I knew I always wanted to go into flight nursing. So I figured if I can go into flight nursing in the military, maybe that would give me a leg up on the civilian side later on in life. And I talked to a recruiter and they put me right at the squadron and I've been here ever since. We recently finished an Air Force Reserve uh, UTA, Unit Training yes. Assembly, very intense, <laughs> lots of training, many, many hours, normal structured stress. Uh, I caught up to you guys over at the medical squadron. You were doing some ACLS training, going through checklists. You were directing people on what to do, this and that and this and that. How did that training from your civilian job help you with the, med with the medical in the reserve? Um, so when I was in the ICU, you were already indoctrinated into so much pathophysiology and how to take care of such critical and acutely ill patients. So doing a class like an ACLS, you take a lot of the skills and the knowledge you've learned on the civilian side and you can easily transfer them to something like a coach situation or um, a rapid response situation that you would see in the hospital or on the plane. Well, like in the military, uh, many of us have had uh, challenges with bosses, relationships. How have you gotten past a bad relationship situation and taken it to the next stage? What's helped you? Um, I think it's just the overall realization that if something is not going well or if something is just not the way you saw it and you think you need to change, it's, it's just pulling the trigger. Um, something that I've learned to talk about is deliberate decisions. So for example, if you want to lose weight, you make a deliberate decision every day to go to the gym. Um, and so it's just, it's not a yes or no, it's you are gonna make this decision and you stick with it and it's not easy, but it's you just take it one day at a time and realize that it's for the better. How do you train and study for situations and then go out there in the real world and maybe it's not just like the book, like the textbook? Mm -hmm. How do you react to that? Um, the big part is that as an experienced flyer and as an experienced nurse, you can take a lot of what you used to do and a lot of the experience you already have and kind of tailor it to what you need now. Um, if not, you can one, rely on who you're with. So. Even as flight nurses, we're never alone. I fly with another flight nurse and three phenomenal techs. So I can always bounce ideas off them, tell me what they think. Um, on the civilian side, I fly with a very highly trained paramedic. So we're never alone. Um, and I think that's what I've learned really throughout the years is that you always, if you don't know, ask for help. And then you, also, you have to trust your partner and know that they know what they're doing. Speaking about patients, how do you deal with helping them get through anguish or the pain mm -hmm. and recover and then how do you deal with your own flashbacks that you may have of a certain medical situation? Absolutely. Um, as far as when it comes to dealing with patients, I think the most important thing is you have to get on their level. You have to see things the way that they are seeing them. Um, for example, some of these patients through the military that were flying back, laying on a litter on the back of a C-130 is not the most comfortable and when you already don't feel well and this is your fifth flight coming out of Afghanistan over five days, you really have to get on their level and make them as comfortable as you possibly can, making sure they're informed. You know, if your flight's delayed, why? You know, if they didn't get a certain thing that they were needing, why? So just really helping them out. Um, as far as coming home, especially after tough flights, you, you have to remember that you're human yourself. I feel like as medical professionals, we go so long and we take care of other people and we, we almost put up a barrier so that we, we don't have time to emotionally react. We need to our knowledge and experience. We have to be, make sound decisions at that point. 
but when you get home, you have to know what helps you relax. Um, I cuddle up on the couch with my dog and watch cartoons, and you know, it just, it helps you come back to that human factor, and then I, I feel like that's kind of what progresses us through our career. We recently spent an entire weekend going through self-aid and buddy care, trying to take care of each other, take care of the airmen. Uh, out in the real world, you've dealt with grandparents all the way down to the little kids. Mm -hmm. How do you handle dealing with children in that st stress and trauma? I think the way you deal with children is, you, one, you have to be prepared. Um, anytime we are going on a flight, usually we'll get a patient wait. And on average, we'll have about a 10 minute flight before we even get there. So civilian side, when I have my paramedic partner, we are crunching numbers or doing everything we possibly can, including emotionally and mentally getting yourself prepared for what you might come up to. Um, at that point, I feel like that gives us a leg up on the situation. We understand what our needs are and what we need in order to get them to where they need to be. Um, as far as when it comes to if it is something that is not, if it's a difficult situation, or again, it's one using your crew and you, knowing that they might have some information that you don't or some knowledge that you don't. And when you're really in a bind, just knowing to stop, take your time, look up something if you have to, because what matters is that that patient is safe and that the care you're giving to them is safe. And if that means stopping for two minutes to look up a reference or dig into an AFI, it's more than worth it because you're doing it for the patient. What makes the loss of a particular patient harder than others when you've done everything you can do and you still lose a patient? I think the hardest parts are we fly patients that have long-term diseases. They've been fighting diseases like COPD or even cancer or something like that. So I feel like they're, it was almost imminent with them. I think it's the traumas and the people who woke up and brushed their teeth and said goodbye to their family and thought that today was totally okay and then it comes to realize that it's absolutely over. I think those are the hardest ones because you weren't prepared for it and neither were them. So you're, you're dealing with different stages of grief and as a clinician you have to decide what stage that is and how you can help them progress to that next stage. Your work as a helicopter paramedic puts you on 24 hour shifts sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I know that would be stressful working 24 hours. How do you go from the 12 hour point up to the 23 hour point to the last 60 minutes? Um, you just do it one step at a time. Um, it, it really is. It, all an adrenaline rush so the time the phone rings and I, I know when that phone goes off because my heart will start to race and you're immediately you're picking it up to get your patient information it's game on I mean it is game on so the second you take off the second that you're going to the hospital the second you initially meet that patient you are just going 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 um, and even on the way I feel like once you drop the patient off wherever they need to go and on the way back you're somewhat starting to decompress and then after that point when we get back to chart is usually when we're sitting at our desks and we're trying to type and if it's on hour 23, 24, 25, that's when we have to, you know, make jokes and listen to music and just kind of drink some coffee and stay awake. But other than that, I think both military and my civilian jobs are completely adrenaline based, so. We've both seen the loss of suicides in the military, mm -hmm. you know, how devastating that is to families and friends, both, uh, I've seen it overseas, you've seen it here in mm -hmm. Illinois. What would you tell somebody that's sitting on the fence right now? What could you tell them to help get them over that, whatever the situation may be? Mm -hmm. I would tell them that there is always doors to be opened and always doors that are open. Um, an analogy that I thought of a couple days ago was whenever your life is a hallway and there's a door at the end of the hallway, you're always going towards that door, whether it's your career path, whether it's a relationship. And whenever that door slams in your face, that's all you can see you can just see that one door that slammed. It's not until you turn around and you see how many doors are open and you just have to decide. And I think that's something that's really hard for some people to see is all they see is that closed door. And sometimes they can't turn around to see those other doors. They need support from family. They need support from friends. They need support from the military to really see, okay, yes, this situation is terrible, but look at all these other situations and look at how many opportunities you have. I think that's something that we really need to start um, really reiterating to some of these members who are having a difficult time. Well, Captain Emery, we appreciate your time today. We're going to put up some telephone numbers for both our reservists and folks uh, nationally. There will be some national uh, suicide awareness hotlines up there. So we thank you for your time today. Thank you.